Over the next few videos, I wanna do a bit of a dive into one of the most important tools for robotics that you've probably never used, and that's Docker. If you come from a software engineering background, then you might have a bit of experience with it, but I'm guessing for most people watching this, you don't really know what it is. At best, maybe you followed some instructions to run it once, but you wouldn't really feel comfortable going and creating your own image that's gonna solve your problem in the way you want it to. In fact, I'm guessing many of you haven't even heard of it. Over the last decade, Docker has grown to become a core tool in many software development pipelines, since it can streamline tasks and solve problems that are otherwise quite tedious. So it's time for us in the robotics world to catch up, because if we're not using it, we're really missing out. In fact, I'd say if you're working on an NVIDIA Jetson, it's almost necessary to be using Docker in order to get the most out of your hardware. So in this short series, we're gonna learn how to use Docker specifically for robotics applications with a focus on ROS. And while I am by no means an expert, there are people out there doing crazy complex stuff with Docker. I have got a bit of experience with it and I can share what things have worked well for me and what hasn't. We'll spend most of this series actually using Docker and trying out different things. But for this first video, we're gonna take a step back and answer two big questions. What is Docker? And why would I especially wanna use it for robotics? Then we'll wrap up with a quick demo showing off some of the basic capabilities. This is an incredibly useful tool and I'm keen to get stuck into it. So without further ado, let's set sail and learn some Docker. So to start off, what is Docker? Many of us will be familiar with the concept of a virtual machine or VM. If you aren't, it's basically a way to simulate a computer running inside your computer. It slices off a bit of your RAM, a bit of your hard drive, some CPU processing time, maybe a graphics card, and you can install a whole other operating system on it. You can start and stop these virtual machines easily, you can back up their whole state to a file, and people have been using them in both desktop and server contexts for a very long time. They're a super handy tool because they let us run multiple operating systems, each with their own different libraries and applications, but they have some downsides. Because you're basically using your computer to run two or more entire operating systems, it's pretty heavy. You want plenty of resources like RAM, they take time to set up because you've got to install the whole OS, starting up and shutting down can be a bit slow, backing them up takes a lot of space, and so on. But Docker isn't a virtual machine. It uses something called containers. For now, we're gonna assume we're on Linux and we'll talk about other operating systems in a later video. But basically, what we do with Docker is we're gonna keep the very core part of the OS, the part that's actually talking to the hardware, the part that's common between different Linux distributions, it's called the kernel. We're gonna keep it the same. And then everything else that runs on top of that, the software libraries, the programs, the file systems, the stuff that normally differentiates different operating systems, we're gonna run all of that inside one of these containers. This is gonna give us most of the benefits of a VM and it loses most of the downsides, at least for the sort of things that we wanna do. We can set up containers that have very specific versions of software and libraries, and they can read and write only to the files that it needs, start and stop very quickly, but without having to dedicate a specific portion of our RAM, our hard drive, and so on. It's not hard to see how useful this is. You can run software that is designed to work only with the latest and greatest operating system on a system that hasn't had an upgrade in years. Not that long ago, the usage of Docker was limited to command line programs, typically in very structured server contexts. But development in the last few years means that we can use Docker for many of the same tasks that used to be done on a VM. Docker is a complex beast, and we're gonna pick it apart bit by bit in the coming videos. But to begin with, there are just two concepts that you need to get your head around. Images and containers. If you've ever installed an operating system before, you might have come across the idea of a disk image. I don't mean a photo of a hard drive. A disk image is a file that contains a, a copy, a snapshot of the entire structure of a drive and all the data on it. If you're setting up a Raspberry Pi or a boot USB, you probably downloaded an image file like an ISO that you flashed onto a disk. That recreated the data structure from the file exactly back onto the drive so that your drive contains the exact same data byte for byte as the person who originally created the image. That person created the image once and people can go and copy that image onto as many drives as they want to. You could then go and modify whatever you wanted on the drive, but if you flash the image back onto it, you'll lose all your changes and you'll be back to the base state. A Docker image is very similar. 
It contains a bunch of programs and files and libraries that are all set up and configured in a particular state that is ready to go. This is stored on the computer, and just like we can flash our disk images onto a drive to make them usable, we can also turn our Docker images from a file into something usable, in this case, a container, as we'll see in a minute. One of the things that differentiates Docker images from disk images though, is that they're layered like an onion. This saves on storage space if you have a lot of similar images. You might have three different images, a basic Ubuntu one, a clean ROS one, and a ROS one that you've installed some extra things on. Because they're all based on Ubuntu, they're gonna share the same common core layer. Then the other two are gonna share the layer that contains the ROS installation. And finally, the custom image will have its own layer with whatever it added. This layering system makes designing Docker images a little bit easier and it saves on storage and bandwidth, but it doesn't significantly change the way we use the images to make containers. We can just treat any given stack of layers as its own image without actually having to know exactly what layers are inside it. By the way, we define what's inside an image using a Docker file. You might have heard of them. Our normal workflow is gonna to be to take an image that was created by someone else, write a Docker file to add some extra layers that contain our specific changes, and then we'll use the new image that results. So that's an image, what about a container? Well, we can run a Docker image to create a container. This is kind of like when we flash an image to a hard drive ready to use it. Once we have a container running, we can get in there, launch programs, edit files, and so on. We can also start and stop our container, just like we'd start up and shut down a computer or a VM. It's worth taking note of the language I just used there. When we talk about running a container or image, that is the process of generating the container from the image, which will also start it up for us the first time. If we then stop and start the container, it'll retain any changes that we've made. But if we run it again, that's just like flashing over the hard drive. It'll wipe away any changes that we've made. If you're not used to containers, you're probably thinking right now that this is a really poor design but it gives us the opportunity to create a very interesting workflow. We can make storage that does persist between runs. There's a few different options as we'll see in future videos. And we put the files that we're working on in there. But otherwise, by making sure that everything else, all the system files and libraries and dependencies, all of that is stored inside the image, we can guarantee that we're always working on a clean system and not relying on something that we installed and forgot about and so on. As we'll see very soon, this improves consistency for development and testing, and it can be really valuable. So we've got our images built up of a bunch of layers using Docker files. We can take an image and use it to run a container, giving us a clean system to work on. We can start and stop that container if we want to, treating it like a VM, but we can also choose to destroy and rerun the container every time keeping any important data in a shared persistent location. Okay, we've got a bit of an idea of what Docker is now, and later in the video, we'll take a look at how to actually run a container. But before we do that, let's look at six reasons that all robotics developers should learn Docker. Number one is running incompatible libraries and operating systems. And this is probably the first thing that most people will use Docker for. As an example, I might have a computer that's running Ubuntu 20.04, but I want to swap between projects that are on Foxy and Humble and Rolling or even ROS1. My computer can't be compatible with all of these at once, but by using Docker, they'll each get their own container and I can swap between them like nothing. This is massive for anyone using an NVIDIA Jetson. NVIDIA provides their own development environment called Jetpack, which has a customized version of Ubuntu that works properly with the Jetson hardware. And this is great, except NVIDIA can sometimes take years to release it, by which time the version of Ubuntu that it's based on is out of date. For example, right now, the latest Jetpack you can get is version 5, which is based on 2004. If you were using ROS, that limits you to Foxy, which is no longer supported. With Docker though, you can use whatever Jetpack you want with whatever software you want, no problems. You can use this same process to go backwards too, which would be helpful for those looking to keep using ROS1, but with newer hardware. The second major use for Docker that you'll see out there is to standardize building and testing. If you've ever worked for a software development team before, you've probably experienced the problem of, oh, it ran on my computer. By using Docker to build and test our code, ideally as part of an automated workflow, we can ensure that the same clean and controlled environment is used every time. 
Now, this might not seem like such a big deal on small personal projects, but once you start to scale things up, it's really vital to make sure that everything is happening correctly. As well as standardizing our building and testing environments, we can also use Docker to standardize our development environment. This way, we can make sure that every single developer on a team is developing against the same libraries and has the same tools available. Some developers might find that the hassle isn't really worth the effort though, and that's where VS Code comes in. We're gonna do a whole video on this, but VS Code has a special mode specifically for working with Docker containers. You can tell it that a particular workspace should use a particular Docker image and have certain extensions and so on. And then every time that you open up that project, VS Code will actually run the Docker container for you in the background. Any terminals that you open in the IDE will be in the container and the whole thing is totally seamless. It's really quite amazing. Fourthly, we've got simplified deployment. Deploying updates to robotic systems, especially out in the field, can be a really fiddly task. But by carefully utilizing Docker images and their layering, some deployment procedures can be simplified, letting us make changes to the code as well as the runtime environment in a minimal and controlled way. And that brings me to point number five, infrastructure as code. There's an idea that's been gaining traction in recent years called infrastructure as code. Now Docker by itself may not exactly fit the definition, but essentially it's about using code, not just to write software, but also to define the environments that that software is run in. And as we've already seen, this provides repeatability, but it has other benefits too. If your Docker file is part of a Git repository, then you're getting version control, backups, and so on of your runtime environment. And again, this is really valuable when you're trying to keep track of what's running on all different robots out in the field. Finally, number six is a bit of a new one, but it's one that I think has the potential to change a lot, especially for education, and that's cloud development. In short, you can host a server somewhere on the cloud to run your code and connect to it remotely using VS Code or a web browser. Now, this idea isn't anything new. There have been platforms like this available for quite a while. But the growth of Docker has made it easier and easier to configure these servers. And there are starting to become some that are super easy to get started with. This can mean that rather than someone having to work on Linux or VMs or Docker on their own computer, they can just make a Docker file and it magically appears on the cloud ready to be worked on. I saw a really neat example of this just the other day with Nav2. You can run their examples straight from GitHub on a real server without having to clone anything to your computer. I'll include a link to that in the description. Okay, we've had a bit of a look at what Docker is and why you'd wanna use it. So for the rest of this video, I'm gonna run through a very basic example of how to use Docker. This isn't really a tutorial, it's more just a bit of a demo to give you a taste of what it can do. In the next video, we're actually gonna go through a tutorial of the installation process. We'll step through how to use it a bit more slowly. So in this case, I've got a computer running Ubuntu 20.04. See there, 20.04 focal, and that means I'm running Ross Foxy. And you can see I've also got Noetic installed on there as well. But let's say there's some new package on Humble I wanna try. If I type docker image ls, you can see I haven't got any docker images at the moment. So what I'm gonna do is type docker image pull, and I want the Ross Humble image. And what this is gonna do, this is gonna to connect to Docker Hub, which is a website. You can get uh, docker images from other places, but it's gonna to go to Docker Hub, and it's gonna find the image called Ross Humble, and you can see now it's pulling down all of those different layers. So we'll wait for them to finish. Okay, that's finished downloading. So now if we type docker image ls, we should see we've got the Ross Humble there. Now we can run a container from this image by typing docker run dash it Ross Humble. Now you see we've got a prompt inside the docker container we're running as root. And if I run those commands again, so opt, whoop, opt Ross, See, we're running Humble on Ubuntu Jammy. How easy was that? Just a few lines. So any code that I ran inside this container now would be running on Jammy. And so if I open up a new tab here and type docker container ls, you can see it tells us we've got a container running. I'm just gonna make this window a little bit bigger. So you can see we're running a container. It's got the Ross Humble image. Um, it's given it this totally weird made up name. Um, that doesn't really matter. That's just so Docker can keep track of it. But if we go back into the container now, let's create a file. So I'm gonna 
go touch my file. And now if I type ls, we can see that my file is there. And so uh, if we now stop the container and go back to container ls, container's not running anymore. So let's run it again. So now that we've rerun it, if I type ls, we can see that file, my file is no longer there. And if I type docker container ls, we can see we've got a new container now. It's been running for only seven seconds and it's got a completely different name. Our old one has completely disappeared. But of course, we could set up a way that we can put our files in there to persist between runs, um, the things that we're developing on and everything else would get wiped away with every fresh run. In the next video, we're gonna see how you can install all this for yourself, get your own files in there, make your own changes and that sort of thing. I know that was a lot to take in, but hopefully it's given you a bit of an understanding of how Docker works and just how much potential it has within the robotics development workflow. In the next video, we're gonna step through how to install and run all this for yourself, get your own files in there, make your own Docker file that builds on top of it. And then in later videos, we're gonna explore how we can integrate it with VS Code, Docker Compose, and other tools so that we can really turbocharge our workflow for developing and building and running our robotic systems. As always, thanks to the patrons over at Patreon for enabling me to make these videos, and especially for your patience as I deal with some of the changes that are going on around here. If you wanna support the channel and also join into the Discord server, there's a link for that in the description. You'll also find a link there to the corresponding thread over at the Articulated Robotics Discussion Forum where you can ask any questions about this video. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.